to all the dearest. Lend me your ear, for I have a tale. It's a tale I've told many times before, and I will probably tell it many more times again and again. This is the tale of a burned girl and a great war and the return of ancient heroes. It is a tale of the world and all its nations and beasts and magics. If you're reading this, or listening to this, I'm honored that you would want to listen. My world is a place that is near and dear to my heart. If you're kind, you're welcome here, and I hope you enjoy your stay. The Burned Maiden. Even in the light of the serpent, the snowy ruins of old Thule meant nothing without him. The roofless chapel held no magic now. The stones told no stories. Gil. My hand went to the jagged metal pendant at my chest. It glowed, too. It was the color of his eyes. I pulled my leather cloak around me tighter and buried my nose into it, shuffling through the snow. My feet clinked on the now worthless grave hoods litter littering the floor. Whichever emperor was buried here had been important to old Thule. I could see it in the specks of light fading from the trinkets, fading east. It had been magic once, too, but the years had worn it all away. Slowly, I went to lean on the large stone altar at the center, trembling. It overgrew with dandelions in the summer, but now it was cold. The altar was glittering. I blinked and realized it wasn't just the snow. I brushed the altar clean and saw trails of magic dust along it forming the curved and hooked patterns, a pattern of opening. We had come here every year during the war, and I had never seen it in the altar before. I removed the mitten from my scarred, talon-like hand and the glove from my healthy one and traced them through the patterns on the altar, leaving the glittering shards of my own east behind in the lines. As I completed them, a seam ran around the rim of the altar, forming a lid. I stepped back, weary, my scars puffed up, red from the exertion of magic. With a gust of golden east wind, stark color rose against the snow. The stone cracked and fell away. I swallowed, panting. I blinked as the east cleared. There, lying in the open casket altar, was a crowned man. His hair was a... The altar was glittering. I blinked and realized it wasn't just the snow. I brushed the altar clean and saw trails of magic dust along it forming the curved and hooked patterns, a pattern of opening. We had come here every year during the war, and I had never seen it in the altar before. I removed the mitten from my scarred, talon-like hand and the glove from my healthy one and traced them through the patterns on the altar, leaving the glittering shards of my own east behind in the lines. As I completed them, a seam ran around the rim of the altar, forming a lid. I stepped back, weary, my scars puffed up, red from the exertion of magic. With a gust of golden east wind, stark color rose against the snow. The stone cracked and fell away. I swallowed, panting. I blinked as the east cleared. There, lying in the open casket altar, was a crowned man. His hair was a black like mine. He had coppery skin, and he wore rusted armor on his arms and legs. He wasn't rotting, but he wasn't breathing. I placed a hand on his forehead. It felt like an electric shock, with another burst of golden east. I gasped, darted back. He inhaled sharply, like awakening from a deep slumber. Mist emerged from his lips, and he was warm. So he was warm. Blinked. His eyes were gold like mine. I hid down watching him tentatively as he took in his bearings. There was a terrible groan of metal as he pushed himself slowly to sitting. But then he was stuck. 
His legs were rusted down. I stood, less nervous now that I knew he could not move, and approached. His eyes fixed on mine, and he smiled gently. He spoke. It was a language I didn't understand. I swallowed and tried to wet my throat, but it was still wasn't any good for talking. My voice slithered out like a wire brush on stone. He winced at its sound, as everyone did. Fire had stolen my voice years ago. I don't understand. I approached him slowly, watching him for any sign of danger. He kept still, opening his palms, weaponless. He seemed to understand that I was wary. I placed a hand on his armored ankles and traced a pattern in his legs to burn away the rust. He snapped at me, snacking away my hand. I jumped back, on guard again. He swallowed, looking at his ankles. Then he blinked, smiled sheepishly. He seemed to realize that this rust was vanishing, and he gestured at his feet, speaking again. It sounded a bit like Thulian, but more ancient. I went to him and finished cleaning off the rust. My east grated off and melted it all away, revealing more east, intrinsic to the armor. It was enchanted, unsurprisingly. The use of magic made the scar on my left face burn hot. I was nowhere near my limit, though. If he attacked me, I was ready. Slowly, the crowned man got to his feet, his clothes in tattered, despite his body still looking flawless. I tried to offer him my cloak, but he refused. He spoke again in that ancient-sounding language. His voice intoned upwards, as if asking a question. I blinked at him, uncomprehendingly. He looked around the snowy ruins, and then back at the casket altar. He pulled out a sword, in a beautiful black and gold sheath. I didn't think he would attack me, but I couldn't understand him at all. I darted away. The crowned man eyed me. Eyes narrowed. And he sat down the sword in the snow at his feet. He stepped back, gestured to it. He was showing he wasn't going to hurt me. So I took it and I handed it back to him. It was his sword, so it was his to bear. With that, I put my gloves back on and offered my healthy hand to him, palm turned up as he had. I could lead him to someone who would understand him. The crown man took my hand tentatively with his armored gauntlet. It was strange. It felt inhuman. But I was inhuman, too. I suppose we were the same like that. Hand in hand, I led him away from the ruins of Old Thule, and we made our way back into town. That was the very first world letter that I ever wrote for Usaya. At that time, I barely had a single spreadsheet for, well, I say spreadsheet, a single sheet spread for my world. Um, describing each country in just a handful of lines and a handful of retold combined fairy tales. In hindsight, I probably should have done more research in the fairy tales, but I was also very eager to get started in working on something new. I had just been through a pretty rough breakup, and so at this time I was using it to process my feelings, so it was really important to me that I just get started. I think if I had ever published this as a full-blown novel or something like that, or perhaps a series, I would want not only to do more research on all of the myths that are inspiring all of the heroic figures, but I'd want to get people from those cultures to really make sure that I was doing it justice, so I was really truly getting their perspective on what these other cultures' heroes are like. But instead, of course, we are left with my perspective on how we perceive modern heroes and how we perceive King Arthur. Our lists are in this world letter. Well, actually, to be honest, I've edited a little bit as I've been reading here. Um, I noticed I have too many ing verbs, something I've been learning to cut out more recently. And in this first world letter, she's very cautious and she's just gone through a great loss of her own, as you've sort of been able to tell from the text. But I wanted to also convey that she wasn't stupid or she wasn't like oblivious to the fact that something very magical and exceptional was happening to her. But I think you'll see her bounce between the emotions of newfound awe and terror of the fact of, the, of her loss and her grief and trauma in the upcoming letters.
in this world letter, I introduced the magic system, Ys. Uh, I was, to be honest, I was really nervous because I was trying to introduce a lot of concepts at once. But looking back on it, I think I, it still holds up pretty decently. I think this nicely conveys uh, the basic premises of ETH, that this is a magic world, that there are multiple layers of history. Um, but I think that the flavor, the text that portrays Arliser's uh, worldview could be stronger, especially around her word choice. Her word choice is fairly generic and not extremely flavorful. I think as I get go on, it gets better. But if before I were to, I don't know, consider it done before I wipe my hands of continuing to tinker with it, I'd probably want to go through and make sure that uh, Arliser's word choice really feels unique to her rather than being, uh, you know, generic fantasy character. And that's, of course, just because I've been writing her for four or five years now rather than at the time this was my first time writing her. So, you know, very exciting stuff. Um, I mentioned this in some other notes on her. Arliser, this isn't the first time I've written an Arliser character, but I think this is the most refined time that I've done it. So I'm pretty proud of how she's turning out. And that's all for today. I hope that you'll look forward to, so I suppose I should go into a little bit, this upcoming series um, where hopefully people will be able to jump in in the middle if they don't want to watch all of them. Um, but this series is a fairly adult fantasy. Um, earlier on here, I was definitely younger, so it's a little bit more YA feeling. But as it goes on, it gets into increasingly more um, adult themes, I think. And uh, basically, in terms of content warning, you warnings, um, you should look out for uh, gore and violence. And uh, there's no sexual assault in the place in in the pages. But it is, but in character backstories, there is sexual assault, and they're dealing with it. Um, and there's also uh, some of the also some of the characters uh, want to have sex. So, like, if any of these things would make you feel uncomfortable, um, I'll try to put up warnings for specific things at the top of videos. But in case I don't catch it or I forget or something, I just want you to know moving forward. Um, if that's if this sort of thing is going to bother you. If you're looking for something that's kid-friendly or child-appropriate, um, I would not recommend following this series with your children. Um, and uh, I suppose the other last thing I should mention is if you go onto my website, you can read it yourself, you can read ahead, um, but I will be continuing to narrate these as audiobooks. Um, I, since this was originally written in emails, uh, the dialogue is formatted a little bit strangely, uh, bec mostly because... Uh, up until recently, uh, my email software hasn't been able to put tabs into things. So since I haven't, I literally have not been able to write properly in like grammatically standard novel English, I have just chosen to create my own format. Mm, so you'll notice that I have the double paragraph breaks and the bullets with just a uh, little ta the two character tags for my character dialogue instead of like denoting what characters say with quotation marks. Um, but I think that this... But I think in the audio format, you probably won't notice this. Um, if this is the sort of thing that bothers you, if you cannot stand it when English is, uh, when English grammar isn't written properly, uh, you will be disappointed because I believe that, lingu that language, I mean, I'm a very burgeoning linguist. I believe that language is, um, linguistics and language is descriptive, not prescriptive. You don't, they're not rules as long as the other person can understand you. Um, there are, of course, certain conventions that will make you seem more or less professional in any given language, but I am not looking to be professional. I am looking to convey my artistic thoughts. So there we are. Um, with all that out of the way, I hope that you enjoy, my dearest friends, and I will see you next time.